Hey, in this video series, we're going to be looking at everything it takes to get this 1978 Ampeg SVT up and running and healthy and sounding like the beast said it should be. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be one of those YouTube guys who's always promoting, promoting, promoting. But, you know, uh, these videos do take a lot of time to, to do well and thoroughly and to edit and all that. And while, yeah, I am promoting myself, and, you know, that's the cost of advertising, you know, if, if you like these, if you find these videos useful or informative, please give them a like. It does help me out a lot. And if you really, really like guitar amps and the esoterica that goes into them and honest gear reviews and uh, pretty much just straight talk about the stuff that you plug into and that makes the noise that you love, consider uh, subscribing. It really would help, and I would appreciate it. But, uh, you know, I don't want to show that every video. I don't want every video to be like, hey, click the like button. And, hey, subscribe. Don't miss a thing. Click the bell. Blah, blah, blah. You know, and talk about VPNs and all that bullshit. There's lots of channels that do that on every video, and you got to wade through that. And I just don't want to do that. So once in a while, I'm going to mention it. And here's one of those whiles. But now, let's get to the cool stuff. i got to remove this panel and this panel to get to things and the fans attached to the panel and it can be a little bit tricky to massage everything without tucking on wires so let me undo this and report back okay all that's out um with the uh, rear panel off here i'm gonna put tape over this external extension speaker jack and over the power amp center return so i remember that this is a speaker jack and the first thing i do is confirm that this is a 10 amp fuse, which it is. So, looking in here, I see original filter caps. I expect probably that they are bad. I'm gonna put this fuse back in, but with a current limiter and meter in place, I have powered the amp on. I want those heaters to draw current for a bit. Once the tubes are hot back here. Oh, by the way, these are the side clamps that I mentioned in the previous SVT video. These are quite nice to have. They don't damage the glass of the tube like the spring retainers do. Let's take this out of standby and see if we have crazy current being drawn. Oh, wait. I'll pause this and hook up a, a dummy load. Okay, dummy load connected. See, I almost broke the first rule of SVT Club. i tell you the other rules, but that's rule number two. All right, it's drawing a lot of current, as a 10 amp amp should, but it's not measuring any shorts, so that much is good. I'm not gonna play through it. I wanted to know if there was something that was really, really hazardous going on. So far, so good. Now, you can see that this amp is in two pieces. There's the preamp chassis there uh, mounted to the front, and there's a power amp chassis. And on this model, it's all connected right here, which is much easier than the later classics and stuff like that. So my first job is just to disconnect everything and pull out the power section chassis and uh, take a look inside. So let's do that next. All right, got the chassis pulled. It's always fun pulling these chassis because you know that those caps can store up to 700 volts DC. So if you stick your fingers in the wrong place without seeing what you're doing, you can zap yourself. So I was very careful on that. I've got the output tubes pulled so that I can invert the chassis because the tubes are taller than the transformers. And I don't want to put that weight on those tubes. The output tubes are a mismatch of GE uh, Sovtech and Svetlana's, and uh, I will probably have them, you know, get them tested and make sure we have equal current draw per side. Looking inside the amp, the top here, I've had some, some heat in this area. I suspect someone changed these resistors as a result. But they could be original. I don't think so. I think the originals would all look like this, the more gray type. But, um, you know, unlike some other MPEGs from this rough era, I'm not sure what the year is yet, 
in this rough era. Um, it's not full of a lot of uh, coupling caps that want to go bad, though they may be lurking in the preamp section. These yellow box caps can be uh, iffy sometimes, but not so bad as the tubular yellow box cap, yellow caps they used, or the uh, tropical fishes. But anyway, let's flip this thing over, see what it's looking like on the other side. Okay, on the inside, uh, between the caps dates and the uh, transformer code, I'm thinking this amp is a 1978, which is good. It hasn't changed that much since the since the 69 version. A few changes, not too many. It's easy to work on. Someone has added an inline additional fuse here. I'll make sure that's you know on the screen or something or HT or something. They put in a grounded power cable. That's good. They let, left in the polarity death cap. That's not good. Um, got a honking big resistor here. Yeah, I'll have to measure voltages. Someone uh, redid the heater balance there. That's good. You see that big burn spot that I pointed to from the top. Um, overall, it's not a terrible job on that. Let me get this to focus right. But I'm concerned by this carbon extending to this other trace. That's a big path. So I would prefer to uh, get that carbon away because it's, it's almost a dead short just in this dirt and carbon that's built up in the board. So um, I will see. I'll pull these resistors from this side because that's just a matter of desoldering them. Lift them up and look at that area of the board. But I would rather remove some board material here and then seal the edges just to keep that. Because that, if there's any connection from here to this carbon, and that carbon is almost here, that's a short that will, will happen again through the board. I hope I didn't go on too long on that. But um, Got a mystery wire here going from one of the filter caps to nothing. I doubt that was leaving the factory like that, so I need to see what's up with that. Um, these old filter caps are not visibly leaking. But this one is bulging, and you know, I don't believe in waiting until something has a catastrophic failure before changing it. If this amp is from 1978 and these caps are 1977, uh, you know, it is past time for new caps. When you have an amp that is intrinsically valuable, and inherently very dangerous, you've got to keep all this stuff working right. So um, the first thing I need to do is price out all new caps. Uh, I can get these two caps. I'll have to find the right schematic for this amp too. I can get these two caps here. They go into the, in the cans. And these three I will replace with FNTs. Uh, might have to do some series connections. I'll have to measure some things, uh, see what's up. But there is generally room on these once uh, these have been removed to put some terminal strips in and around this area to hold new caps. And uh, I might even uh, just put in some terminal strips and use some new radial caps. I'd rather use uh, a couple of smaller radial caps in series to get things and know that they're going to run really well than have a precariously uh, attached or crammed in larger axial. And uh, I'll do that board area there. Uh, before I can do any of that, I've got to pull the uh, preamp out and see what things are like inside there. All right, here's the insides. More of those yellow box caps. Some polystyrenes looks like. That's some tropical fish. Those are usually bad. I definitely see a problem here. That resistor should not be blowing up. So that resistor will be found on the schematic and replaced. But more importantly, before I power it back up, I'll make sure that nothing is drawing more current to that point than there should be. And uh, everything else here looks Pretty good, with the exception of those uh, tropical fish that always fail. Let's look at the other side. Okay, one more filter cap to change. These boards are very easy to work on. 
um, all the switching goodies. Hopefully everything there will be fine. I'll just need to clean things on the pots and switches. Sometimes, though, uh, I do have to do some work in there, and that can be labor-intensive. Speaking of which, it took me about 20 minutes to get this uh, preamp chassis out of the app. Uh, I don't know whether it's a recover, whether it used to have Tolex and someone put on the carpet, or whether it came in 1978 with this carpet that you'd find in the back of a pickup truck all over it. But the carpet was really thick, and the uh, chassis didn't want to come out. I finally got it to work. You know, you don't want to damage things, but sometimes you just got to say the hell with it and give it a good, good shove. So that's what I did, and it'll go back just fine, but... So, like I said, the first thing I've got to do on this board is uh, find that resistor right there that's trying to catch on fire, which is right over here. It's like R46. Let's see why that might be. And uh, there's some brown glue on the board there by that little toroid and MPEG used that at various times and sometimes it becomes conductive let's hope that's not the case here so uh, next is to find the correct schematic for this app it was not printed on the uh, shielding cover like on a lot of MPEGs and once I find the correct schematic then it's a matter of finding all the parts, get my build materials ready for the repair, uh, including a new power switch because this switch is broken internally and the amp is always on whenever it is plugged into the wall. So that needs to be changed. Shouldn't be too difficult, I should think, but when you get into the world of 1978 MPEGs, sometimes there are surprises waiting for you. There's the front panel. If anyone out there wants to correct my estimate of a 1978 code, in addition to the power switch not working, this light isn't coming on. Seems to be in pretty good cosmetic condition for a 1978-ish amp. Uh, I'm not too concerned about it in the long run. Just a little bit of dust, all that cleans up easily and a couple of the solder joints on these tube sockets aren't uh, inspiring a huge amount of confidence in me, but those will all get redone. Okay, time to trace down the schematic and get the bill of materials together. And, you know, I try to explain why some apps are expensive to repair. By the time I know everything that I need to get this app safe to operate, and I have found all the parts uh, and I've got the whole thing together, and I'm ready to place the order, I'll have probably about an hour and a half in this amp before I've done anything. Um, SVTs are worth it, but they are not uh, a casual purchase. Every 15 years or so, they need some major service. This one has had relatively minor service over the decades, just those burn 5 watts I showed you earlier. And so... You know, the longer you put this stuff off, the more expensive it gets. If this thing had been routinely maintenanced every 10 years, uh, you wouldn't have one large bill. It would have been spread out over the years. But I digress. Okay, I've got a lot of stuff done uh, in preparation for the new parts arriving. and I've got all the parts that I definitely know I will be changing out listed and priced up. Um, I'm making a note to myself to examine what's going on here with this output jack where they first had a, cat, a resistor to ground and then they jumpered it and it's common to have ground loops in this area so later when I redo the AC power wiring and generally neaten up some of the spaghetti and uh, put in the new filter caps in this area I'm making a note to myself to really make sure that all this stuff is good and that uh, there are no ground loops and everything is connected to the proper point. But for right now, I've gone through this main board and everything that was either out of spec or a drifted value 
or uh, some of the resistors had broken leads, some of the resistors uh, had broken solder joints, um, things like the screen uh, resistor network being changed on later amps uh, to better work with current production tubes. I think that's important to do here. Here, um, this amp originally had 3.2 ohm, 5 watts on the uh, plates. That's where that burning came in there. Uh, someone had put in 5.6 ohms. I'm putting the, the later 10 ohm in there. It just draws a little bit less current. Uh, and uh, on all these, the large 5 and 10 watt resistors, like the plates on the uh, 12AU7s, uh, some of them had broken leads and or broken inside the solder joints due to the mass of them. I'm using some Vichy low mass resistors. Now here, where this bad heat damage was in the past, you can see that. I have cut the board here and here, so there is no path from that little area to that charred area, and there is no path from that charred area to that trace. And I've sealed that with clear nail polish, and it will get another coat. And I have uh, begun the process of removing the, uh, the coating off this uh, copper trace here and here, which means that um, I'll be able to reinforce this entire connection, which is one of the plate supplies, one of the uh, primaries on the output transformer, with a bit of bus wire. So each, uh, so from here to here, there'll be a solid bus wire that that resistor will join to. That's going to be a much more solid mechanical connection than connecting the lead of that resistor to the lead of these resistors, like the previous guy did. Some heavy duty bus wire will not go amiss there. And it won't just be attached to the resistor. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to expose some, some more of this copper so there'll be a more surface area. I've gotten a bunch of flux off. There's still some puddles of flux and dirt on the edges where I'll have to get in there later with a soft bristle toothbrush because if I do that with a paper towel, it will just, yeah, little bits of torn paper towel everywhere. You know, and I'll have to get some more off here because that old flux coating, you can see where it is and where it isn't. You know, flux coating and dirt where I have cleaned. That flux can, in time, not in all cases, but it can to become a conductive path and uh, on something with this much uh, voltage and current and uh, uh, this high of a value, you know, you don't want to have anything go weird because there's a uh, path um, where there should not be just because I didn't go in there with a, a soft bristle toothbrush and get the stuff out. So this is round one of cleaning. Round two, we'll get this almost factory new. I pause this and show the preamp stuff. Okay, here's the preamp. On the power section, I forgot to mention that I am replacing pretty much every coupling cap in these amps because some of them are guaranteed to be leaky. But if I leave all the originals in and then just find the leaky ones, that just adds immensely to the repair time. This is not shotgunning. This is spinning the client's budget wisely. It is much easier for me to replace all the old coupling caps with high-quality ones that I know will be um, rated for more than the capacitance, uh, sorry, the, more than the voltage present. This entire thing is getting Panasonic ECQs in all the appropriate voltages and values, output section and preamp section. They're very reliable. They're very low mass. There's no strain on the solder joints on the single-sided board. Um, they're they're going to sound fantastic, and they're not expensive. Um, on this, you can see here and here, these were, this was that burned resistor, and that is a, a cathode resistor. And this is a cathode resistor as well, which is actually a cathode follower, which has a good bit more voltage on it. Though this was a bootstrapped uh, cathode, so it still had quite a bit of voltage on it. And since uh, this one gave up the ghost on that half watt resistor, and this one had a one watt um, carbon composite um, that had drifted badly. These are both 47Ks. I put in these metal oxide 47K uh, 2 watt resistors. So those should not uh, be stressed in the cathode uh, follower and um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Bootstrapped cathode circuit. I'm not watching my focus, am I? Sorry. So those are the re resistors that I know needed to be changed. 
I suspect this carbon, uh, these two carbon comps are not original. I may change those as well while I'm in there um, because there's no tonal benefit to using them in this circuit. But you want to make sure that everything really is good. I just hadn't measured those yet. Uh, I've cleaned these tube sockets, at least round one of cleaning, and got a lot of funk from over the decades out. So this thing's going to sound a lot better with all new coupling caps, and it really is easy to change them all out rather than one at a time because that could add two, three hours to the whole process, and that just adds up. Uh, you know, I'm talking all the all the caps in this entire app in terms of the coupling caps cost about nine dollars. So easy to do, inexpensive. It's a no-brainer. Uh, the important thing about an SVT is not whether it has the original caps leaking or not. The important thing is uh, sometimes the old tubes, if they're working well, but always, always, always the circuit itself and the transformers. And those are the things that uh, you cannot really replace uh, without spending a ton of money. But in terms of making this sound like 1978, I don't care about making it sound like a 40-year-old from 1978. I want to make this thing sound like 1978 uh, again and be really, really reliable. So I'm going to go through and measure those. Um, I'll just show this a little bit. Let's see if I can get this to focus. All right, these are all the components that are getting changed on this app, the check marks. Uh, the, all the components written down uh, are the ones that needed to be changed. Um, this is the filter cap stuff. I've got to order some stuff. Um, um, the cross that one measured fine. Uh, the check marks means that I've added it to the order. And we're looking at a grand total of parts on this app, uh, including the, the new filter caps. So about $90. So uh, about $9 of which are the coupling caps. Most of it's higher wattage resistors and then the uh, filter cap stuff. But... Uh, that's not too bad for uh, uh, every 40 years service, apparently. should be every 15 to 20 years, but this one's an every 40-year amp. Um, 